On July 7, 2021, Steve Ballmer's net worth officially surged past $100 billion, making him the ninth individual to join the Senta Billionaire Club. All of his peers have one thing in common, they founded the top companies in the world, whether that be Google and Facebook or Oracle and Amazon. But Steve is unlike anyone else at the top. Not only did Steve not found a major company, but he also didn't make any unbelievable investments like investing into Bitcoin in 2009 or investing into Amazon during the dot-com crash. For the most part, Steve was just at the right place at the right time. So here's how Steve Ballmer was able to make $100 billion working at 9 to 5. Taking a look back, Steve Ballmer was born on March 24, 1956 in Detroit, Michigan. He was the son of an immigrant family from Switzerland and his dad was a manager at Ford. Though Steve never started his own company, he definitely had the intelligence for it from a very young age. Steve attended a college preparatory school called Detroit Country Day School where he graduated as valedictorian. Aside from graduating at the top of his class, Steve also aced SAT, scoring a perfect 800 on the math section. Nowadays, these achievements are basically prerequisites to even be considered by Harvard. But back in 1973, Harvard's missions were much more reasonable, and Steve was admitted into the class of 1977. At Harvard, Steve majored in applied mathematics and economics. In his free time, he worked on the school newspaper and even served as a manager for the Harvard Crimson football team. But by far the most important part of his undergraduate studies was becoming friends with a young man named Bill Gates. At the time, Bill Gates was just about to drop out and start Microsoft. Some reports suggest that Bill even asked Steve to drop out with them and be a leading voice at Microsoft. But Steve preferred to stick to the safe path and finish out his degree at Harvard. I don't think anyone can blame him for this decision. I mean, who cared about personal computers in 1975? Anyway, after Bill Gates dropped out, Steve and Bill started to pursue radically different paths for a couple of years. While Bill went all in on Microsoft, Steve continued his academic excellence, graduating magna cum laude in 1977. After graduation, Steve landed a solid job as a project manager at Procter & Gamble. He would only work there for two years though, before he went back to school to get an MBA from Stanford. During the following summer, Steve would approach Bill Gates, wondering if he could get a summer job at Microsoft. Though Steve just wanted a summer job, Bill wanted a much bigger commitment from Steve. Bill asked Steve to drop out of Stanford and become Microsoft's first full-time manager. Steve was unwilling to take the leap of faith five years ago, but now he was in a much more secure position. He had a Harvard degree under his belt, a couple of years of experience at Procter & Gamble, and he only had one year left on his Stanford MBA. So, even if Microsoft failed, Steve wouldn't have any trouble finding a high-paying job elsewhere. Despite this, his parents were actually still quite worried about him pursuing Microsoft. When Steve told his parents about Bill's offer, his dad said, What the heck is software? And his mom said, Why would a person ever need a computer? As you can see, Steve's parents weren't quite convinced about Microsoft. But Steve would nonetheless go ahead and join Microsoft on June 11, 1980. This made Steve the 30th employee at Microsoft, where he earned a salary of $50,000 per year. That's the same as $163,000 today. More than a solid salary though, Bill promised Steve 5-10% to equity in the future. On paper, Steve was a business manager at Microsoft, but according to Steve, he was basically Bill's personal assistant. Apparently, he did everything from hiring new employees to cooking and washing bottles. Steve's breakout moment wasn't far behind though. Later in 1980, Microsoft would have a monumental meeting with IBM and Bill would ask Steve to come along to the meeting. This wasn't some super smart strategic move or anything like that though. Apparently, Steve was the only guy who knew how to wear a tie. His presence, however, would prove to be much more useful. You see, neither Bill Gates nor Paul Allen really had any experience negotiating contracts or forming partnerships. Steve didn't have much experience himself, but he was the most experienced of the bunch. During negotiations with IBM, the trio were able to include one game-changing clause into the contract with IBM, which was non-exclusivity. IBM would pay Microsoft $430,000 to develop MS-DOS, but since the deal was non-exclusive, Microsoft could turn around and sell the software to other computer manufacturers as well. Now, IBM wasn't stupid, and they didn't get duped by a couple of young businessmen. The reason they agreed to the non-exclusive deal was because they themselves were being investigated for monopolistic practices. So, they let the non-exclusivity with Microsoft slide. In 
Between 1981 and 1985, Bill Gates would get to work on the technical side of MS-DOS. Meanwhile, Steve Ballmer would get to work on the business side of MS-DOS, selling it to several computer manufacturers. This grew Microsoft's revenue from $16 million in 1981 to $140 million in 1985. Clearly, hiring Steve was a great move, and Bill would deliver on his promise, awarding Steve 8% equity in the company. When the company went public in 1986, Microsoft would be valued at $780 million at the end of the first trading day. Bill Gates' 45% stake was worth $350 million, and Paul Allen's 25% stake was worth $195 million. While those are awesome amounts, it's not that surprising given that they were the founders. Steve Ballmer didn't boast his stake as large as Bill and Paul, but his 8% stake translated to a whopping $51.5 million. He had only worked at Microsoft for 6 years at the time, meaning that he basically earned upwards of $10 million per year. I'm sure his parents were much more convinced about Microsoft after this. But this was just the beginning. After all, Steve wasn't even worth 0.1% of how much he's worth today. So let's get back to his story. Now that the formative days of Microsoft were over, Steve took on more traditional corporate roles over the next 6 years. He led various divisions and served in many manager and director roles. It wasn't until 1992 that Steve officially became an executive as he took on the role of Vice President of Sales and Support. During his time as VP, his most important contribution was leading the development of the NET framework. After 6 years as Vice President, Steve would be promoted to President of Microsoft in July of 1998, making him second in command after Bill Gates. And once Bill Gates stepped down as Microsoft CEO at the turn of the millennium, Steve Ballmer would reach the pinnacle of his career, taking on the role of Microsoft CEO in January of 2000. Unfortunately, Steve Ballmer would become known as one of the most useless CEOs out there. But I don't really think this is true. Everyone who talks down on Steve Ballmer mainly just points out the stagnation of Microsoft stock over the next 14 years and the various goofy moments of Steve. Now, let's be honest, he had a lot of goofy moments. Here he is repeating the word developers one too many times. Developers, 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 developers. Developers, 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 developers. And here's a clip of Steve going ballistic on stage. Ladies and gentlemen, Steve Bomber! And yes, Steve did laugh at the launch of the iPhone. $500 <laughs> fully subsidized with a plan? I said, that is the most expensive phone in the world. And it doesn't appeal to business customers because it doesn't have a keyboard, which makes it not a very good email machine. Now, it may sell very well or not. I, you know. But jokes aside, Steve was actually just super passionate about Microsoft. And the lack of stock growth during his time as CEO wasn't really his fault. You see, Bill Gates literally handed over Microsoft to Steve at the peak of the dot-com bubble. The dot-com crash literally started two months after Steve took over. In 2000, Microsoft stock peaked at $58 per share. But within just 12 months, Microsoft stock crashed to just $21 per share. So, Microsoft was down 63% from their highs within the first year and a half of Steve's leadership. And just as Microsoft stock started to recover, they got crushed by the financial crisis down to $15 per share. But fundamentally speaking, Steve actually pushed Microsoft forward quite a bit. First of all, Steve Ballmer was a massive proponent of the Xbox. Many executives in the company thought that Microsoft should stick to software and that building a gaming console was way out of whack. But Steve Ballmer stood strong in his support for the Xbox and today, the Xbox is one of their most successful products. Similarly, in 2010, it was under Steve Ballmer's leadership that Microsoft launched their cloud service, Azure. Azure is likely the number one project that eventually allowed Microsoft to break out of stagnation and grow exponentially over the past five years. And though Steve didn't see the potential of the iPhone, he did see the potential of several other projects. In 2007, for instance, Microsoft invested $240 million into Facebook. At the time, the company was only worth $15 billion. Today, they're worth a trillion dollars. But by far the clearest evidence that Steve had a positive effect on Microsoft was the bottom line. During Steve's time as CEO, Microsoft's revenue nearly tripled from $25 billion to $70 billion. 
and their profits more than doubled from $9.4 billion to $22 billion. Investors simply didn't realize the positive impact of Steve Ballmer until after he left. Anyway, after Steve Ballmer retired from Microsoft in 2014, he would turn around and buy the LA Clippers in May of 2014 for $2 billion. Around the same time, Steve Ballmer became the largest individual shareholder of Microsoft. Over the past 30 years, he had sold off about half of his initial 8% stake, leaving him with a 4% stake in Microsoft. But Bill Gates had been selling his shares and diversifying much faster. Today, Bill Gates has shrunk his position in Microsoft from 45% down to just 1.3%. If Bill Gates had held on to his entire stake, he'd be worth $900 billion today. And if Steve Ballmer never sold any of his stake, he'd be worth $160 billion today. Ironically, if Steve didn't sell any of his shares, he'd be worth more than Bill Gates today. Though Steve has cut down his position over the years, he's extremely proud of being Microsoft's largest individual shareholder, and he thinks that Microsoft is the best company in the world. In fact, he banned the Clippers from using Apple products, and apparently, he doesn't let any of his family members use iPhones. I think we'd all agree that his enthusiasm on stage wasn't just for show, and that he definitely wasn't exaggerating when he said, I have four words for you. I love this company. Yes! And that's how Steve Ballmer managed to make an astounding $100 billion working at 9 to 5. What do you guys think about Steve's stage presence? Comment that down below. Also, drop a like if you guys agree that Steve Ballmer was an underrated CEO. And of course, consider joining our Discord community to suggest future video ideas and consider subscribing to see more questions logically answered. But until then, I'm Hari, and I'll see you guys on the next one.